Welcome back guys. This is the second video in the vasoactive drug series. In this series we're talking about alpha, beta, and calcium receptors, ABCs of vasoactive drips. Um, in the first video we talked about alpha receptors. Um, I'm going to take one minute to go over some of the takeaway memory tricks from that video and then we'll talk about beta receptors. Um, so in the first video we talked about how alpha agonists um, cause vasoconstriction because type A people have a tight squeeze, a tight grip on what's going on. Uh, we have A for afterload, so if you bind to alpha, you're going to increase your afterload. Um, and also a lot of these drugs end in efferin because type A people um, want to efferin get an A on every test. And some of the examples are listed there below. In our bottom column here, we have our alpha-2 agonists, which end up blocking alpha-1. Um, by working centrally. So clonidine and Presidex are examples of those drugs. And remember that they work centrally, so they're going to cause some CNS depression, some sedation, as well as vasodilation. So today in this video, we're going to be working on this column here, beta, beta agonists, and beta blockers. So it's important to know where beta blockers are located. So I like to remember B for beating and breathing, and that's because beta receptors are located on your heart and lungs. It's beating and breathing. Um, so you have beta 1 receptors and beta 2 receptors. So we know beta receptors are on your heart and lungs because of beating and breathing, which both start with B. Um, and the traits you're remembering which receptors, type 1 or type 2, are on your heart and which ones are on your lungs is that you have one heart and two lungs. So beta 1 is going to be on your heart and beta 2 is going to be on your lungs. That's a picture of lungs there, two lungs. So let's think about what happens at your heart and your lungs when you have sympathetic nervous system stimulation, which is what happens when you bind to these receptors. So when you bind to your heart, um, you're going to have a fight or flight response, which is increased heart rate and increased contractility. Um, and another word for drugs that increase contractility are inotropes, or positive inotropes. Um, so for beta 2 on our lungs, if we bind to beta 2, we're going to have a sympathetic nervous system response, fight or flight response in our lungs, which is going to be bronchodilation. So let's talk about examples of these drugs. Um, so for beta 1, it's on your heart. So I like to think the heart sort of sounds like dope, dope. Dope. So dopamine and dobutamine are examples of beta-1 drugs. Um, other drugs uh, that cause inotropic activity, increased heart rate, increased contractility are epinephrine, norepinephrine, Um, as well as milrinone, which I've seen used more in pediatrics. So I'm going to further divide this beta-1 category into um, inotropes that act as pressors and inotropes that are inodilators. Um, so dobutamine and milrinone are inodilators, which means that they are inotropes, but they also vasodilate after the heart. And that makes them really great drugs for congestive heart failure, um, con cardiogenic shock from congestive heart failure. Because um, with congestive heart failure, you want your heart to work better. So you want to increase contractility of your heart. Um, and you want to make it easier for your heart. So you want to decrease the load that your heart is pushing against, decrease afterload. Um, so inodilators are going to do just that. So that makes dobutamine a really great drug for CHF. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine um, are also pressors. And if you remember, they all three of those were in our alpha video as alpha agonists. And you know, A for afterload, they're going to vasoconstrict, they're going to increase afterload. So they are pressors as well as inotropes. 
Um, so they're really only good if you want to increase your heart rate as well as uh, vasoconstrict. Um, so dopamine and dobutamine can sound very similar, even though they're very different inotropes. Um, so my trick for remembering that is that dobutamine, take this B-U-T here, is better, buter, for CHF. Um, so it's a nice drug um, if you really want the inotropic activity without increasing the workload on your heart. So that's beta agonists. We'll talk down here in this bottom column about beta blockers. So let's talk about each of our receptors again. Um, each of the receptors that we were binding to at the top, we're going to block here at the bottom. So beta 1, if we block beta 1, BB for beta blocker, um, we're going to have decreased heart rate, decreased contractility. So that's great for people whose heart rate is naturally too high, like they're in atrial fibrillation, um, atrial flutter, something like that. We want to decrease their heart rate. Or for people who just have high blood pressure, we want to decrease um, heart rate, decrease contractility, um, relax your heart a little bit so that it's not working as hard, it's not producing as high of a blood pressure. So that's what happens if you block down beta 1. If you block down beta 2, you're going to have bronchoconstriction. Because that's the opposite of what happened up here at the top with bronchodilation. We're going to have decreased um, sympathetic nervous system response, and so we're going to have bronchoconstriction. Um, and you might ask, well, why do we want a drug that's going to bronchoconstrict someone? And we don't really. Um, it just happens to be a side effect of drugs that are not cardioselective. They're not specific to beta 1. They actually bind to beta 1 and beta 2, um, called non-selective beta blockers. And they're going to cause bronchoconstriction as well as a decrease in heart rate, decrease in contractility. So they would be a poor choice for someone with something like asthma um, or other respiratory condition. But for a lot of people whose lungs are healthy, um, it's a tolerable side effect. It's not very noticeable. So we do have drugs, though, for people with poor respiratory condition that are cardioselective, so they only bind to beta-1. Those are cardioselective beta blockers. So let's talk about some examples of beta blockers. So one side effect that men especially complain about with beta blockers is that they cause impotence. Uh, so my joke is that ba beta blockers are baby blockers, and when you tell that joke, people lol, lol, which is the ending of these beta blocker drugs. So whatever you need to do to link lol with beta blockers, so what I do is baby blockers, lol, beta blockers. Um, so all of our beta blockers are going to end in lol. Um, there's three cardioselective beta blockers that I have memorized, and that's metoprolol, atenolol, and esmolol. And I'll give you a trick for that too. Um, so my trick is if you met someone who's really hot on a 0 to 10 scale, so they're a 10 on that 0 to 10 scale, you met a 10 um, who you found mesmerizing, kind of rearrange these letters here, mesmerizing, you could be cardioselective towards them. You could have a crush on them or want to date them. So if you met Toprolol, a 10 lol, who was a mesmerizing, um, you could be cardioselective towards them. So what about our non-selective beta blockers? Um, those are all the other lols that aren't cardioselective. So if you memorize metoprolol, atenolol, and esmolol are cardioselective, everything else you see ending in lol is going to be non-cardioselective. So propranolol, abetalol, carbetalol, any other lol you come across is probably a beta blocker um, that's non-cardioselective. Propranolol, carbetalol. And that is our beta video. So thanks for watching. Uh, comment below if you have any questions, if you found this helpful, um, or if you have ideas for our future videos that I can do, uh, things that you want help remembering. Uh, watch for the next video, which is on calcium channels.